a person says, I don't like the Venus Project, they don't know what they're talking about, because there's no bias in it, no fresco promoting his stuff, or anybody promoting their stuff. It's all based on statistical data. That's what the Zeitgeist Movement doesn't have in its meetings. And they have everybody bullshitting about all kinds of things. You gotta get down there to the meetings and describe what the Venus Project is. We do a survey of arable land. You know what I mean? Sure. And after we learn what the carrying capacity is of the environment, we design cities proportionate to carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. And if you come up with a new invention that extends the carrying capacity, we use that. But no opinions. Is that clear for everybody? Mm -hmm. Now that's the only system that I can think of that's just. There's no way to work this out with this system using money. If I put up two million to get you elected, you owe me a favor, man. So all systems today, you pay off senators, put money in Swiss banks. Don't try to patch this up. It won't work. And to go to a hospital in the old days, uh, there was a time when the doctor would come to your home for three dollars, and he was concerned with the family. Today, if you get them through fast, move them through, give them 20 minutes each, no longer, you make more money. Or if medicine becomes a business and everything becomes a business, you may tell a guy, uh, my car needs an overhaul, how much is it? Well, he says, I'm sorry, it needs an overhaul. Well, it'll cost you $2,000. He's not sorry. He makes a living that way. You break a leg. The hospital will bill you for thousands of dollars a day. Take you years to pay off that debt. It's no good moving in the wrong direction. Having armies and navies does not is not there to support people. It's there to support the establishment. Do you know what that means? Okay. Police are not here for your protection. They're here to mainly support the establishment. So we don't want an established culture. This is called an established culture. We want an emergent culture that's constantly changing. Like even the city I designed here, those of you that didn't get it, I want you to take the paper out of the way if you can, pull the cups away from it. It has everything, it has everything that people need in that city. It has indoor agriculture, outdoor agriculture. Hundreds of bicycles for your use. You don't know anything anymore. You can get on a bike and ride through the country. You go to the golf course, you go to the clubhouse, check out whatever clubs you want, play, leave them there. When you're lugging all that shit home with you. You got a closet with skis and cameras and all. You go to the camera center and check out a camera. When you don't want it, don't want to use it, drop it off at the camera center. There they keep the key chairs. And more things are available to more people. But if you want a camera permanently, you can have it. Sure. You don't own anything in this. It's not owned. There's no taxation, no rent, no fees for anything anymore. I don't know if you know this, but you go to Walmart, you see all kinds of stuff there. We can turn out everything people need. We don't need to sell things anymore. You can go back to school and study what you want to study, not what somebody else thinks you want to study. Because most jobs today, when guys get out of school, they'll be right out. The job is training. Is anybody going to school now? What do you study? International relations. What? International relations. International relations. Yeah, I heard. <laughs> 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 will not be necessary. If you study robotics, you may get, if, if you don't know how long are you into it. How long have I been studying it? Or yeah. how long is it? How long have you been studying it? Two years. That's my yeah. second year now. Too bad. <laughs> you want to turn out to robotics and automation as the fields of the future. And even that will be phased out in time. Are you going to school? Yeah. What are you studying? I'm studying law. Law? Yeah. That will be out fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because Hopefully. a lawyer uh, can defend the person and then can use language in different ways and turn people around. 
we don't use law in the future because then nobody can take anything away from you in the future. No business, no one can lie to you because everyone will be in the profession that renders service to the world. Make he'll sense. be in agriculture, he'll be in distribution of goods, she might be in transportation. So everything a person's in is beneficial. But if a man has a dry goods store, he's there to make a profit. You understand yeah. what I'm getting at? Everybody, you break a leg, I make dough patching up your leg. The window is broken, he sells glass, he makes money. But in the future, windows are made not to break. All research is done to make things last. But if you let, is it possible to make things that don't wear out? Let me describe that process to you. So you know how to answer that question. These are what they call these are called rare earth magnets. They're so powerful, it's hard for most people to pull them apart. You have to break it apart like that. And it's difficult for people to push together, hold it rigidly, try to push them together. No, no, they'll go together that way, <laughs> opposite direction. This way? Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's pretty impossible. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to try I've to push it those. together? They're very hard to put. Hold it rigidly. Grab it tight. And push them together. <laughs> push! <laughs> it's pretty difficult, is it? Okay. Now, if you can picture all of these magnets in a circle, and the inside is a shaft on an automobile that is repelled off the surface and turns in a magnetic field, it needs no lubrication, no ball bearings, and no wear. You guys over here want to try to you know, see if they were raised in a circle to repel it. That's how magnetic trains work. There's no wheels. They don't wear out. No bearing. And if there's no wheels and no wear, if you do that in all rotating surfaces, you don't need lubrication. So one person asks me, is there enough resources to take care of everybody in the world? Use them wisely, yes. Using them that way. And we will have all research labs on heart disease, kidney disease, with all the equipment they need. What do you need? An electron microscope? What do you need? We don't dig up nickels and dimes for heart disease research. We give them whatever the hell they need. Because all people can go blind. All people can get cancer. That's this is right. So you wonder, does the government really care about me? I'm telling you no, because cigarettes would not be available. Cigarettes, if you smoke for a certain length of time, you'll get heart disease or cancer. They're really cancer sticks. Now the government recently says this may be dangerous to your health, but they still sell them. Why? Because they get kickback taxation. That goes more people are killed by liquor on accidents than many wars. Why does the government permit it? Because well, I guess that's what people want now. That's what they tell you. But if you're educated as a kid, you won't know. <coughs> You won't drink liquor, but you'll drink other drinks that are not harmful. So the government, if the government cared and industry really cared, they wouldn't have sourced to China, but they would lose a competitive edge. And the sort of country would collapse economically, so they're forced to be sons of bitches. Do you understand? So when I was a kid, it was normal to have children working in factories. I'm talking about 10 years old. They work on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, every day of the week. And women marched to, to end child labor. It took them years because the North couldn't compete with the South, and that's why they had the battle. They didn't do it to free the blacks, like they say. The North couldn't compete with the South. The South didn't pay. They had a lot of slaves. So they had an economic advantage. So what people work for in this society is economical advantage. If you can't see too well, 
he makes money selling your eyeglasses. I don't say it's bad. It's bad in the long run, the money system, because it, it's parasitic on everybody. Everybody is your enemy. Every a lawyer is right, right there when you need them. But the guy that puts out the shit that you don't like, you get a lawyer to take care of that one. So you make people sign contracts, that means you don't trust anybody. There was a time in America, even a short time, where people shook their heads. <laughs> they had an agreement. When guys said, put it on paper, that means they don't trust each other. So the society is no good. All societies. Now, how do you change them? I'll go back to the Klan and show you how I changed the Klan. First thing I did, Lou said to me, what do you think of the Klan? says, it's a great idea, but doesn't go far enough. Don't attack. It. Said, what do you mean? So if you want to get to a person, don't say what you're doing is stupid. It won't work. Use strategies. So I took a gun, a real gun, and a mirror. <coughs> and when my little girl was three years old, I put a cigarette in her not lit. And taught her how to roll her lips when I fired the gun. With a mirror at 40 feet, I split the cigarette right near her mouth. Tobacco was blown all over the place. I put a hairpin in the cigarette and tore, cut her with a razor blade almost through. When she rolled her lip, the hairpin blew tobacco all over the place. And this head of the clan said, you're the best child I ever saw. He didn't know that. And he said, will you come on down to the clan and talk to our boys about how to use a gun? And I said, I'd like to, Lou. And what you're doing in your lab? I said, Lou, they would not listen to me. He says, I'm head of the clan. I'll get them to listen. That's all I needed. Okay. I used to train police dogs years ago how to lead the blind. You know, the, when it comes to the traffic, the dog would look up, they can't see color, and they know the position of the light, and they wouldn't let the guy cross. So a sweet old lady, about six years old, came over and said, what a nice dog, it leads the blind. I said, no, that dog isn't nice. I could have trained it to kill people. Tear them to pieces. You know what I'm saying? Or be the blind. Dogs are neither good nor bad. People are neither good nor bad. Depends on where you're brought up, your values, and your family life. If you live in a family where your father beats the shit out of your mother all the time, and you, boy, I'm never getting married. Where you're coming from, that makes sense. You know what I mean? Depends on where people are coming from, their values. There are no good or bad people. There are different people because they come from different cultures. Do you understand that? So if you hate Swedes or Norwegians, when I was a kid it was normal to say, let's get some dumb Swede to clean out our cellar, or some dumb Polak, or a chiseling Jew, or a conniving Wop. <laughs> they had something for everybody. <laughs> so all people really need the same thing, clean air, clean water, good food, and a relevant education, meaning an education that utilizes and takes care of the earth, does not pump poisons into the right lakes and rivers. Uh, Roxy, did you want something? Yeah, can you finish the clan story? You broke it up four times already. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is I got there and I talked to the clan. They listened to me, because Lou made them listen. Then I did something else. I did something unique and individual. I turned to Lou and said, how is it that you can look at a person and tell us all about that person and you don't even know them? He said, I, that's my nature. I can do that with people. I said, would you mind demonstrating it so I would learn how to do that? He said, no, I didn't think I could teach you anything, John. I said, well, if you can do that, you teach me a lot. So I brought a picture in, a series of photographs and I projected them on the wall, and Lou looked at this character I projected, he said, he looks like a God-fearing man, a war veteran, a Christian, family man, all kinds of things. He was projecting his own values at the picture. I got the picture from the post office. When Lou was finished, I pulled the bottom of the picture out, and it said, wanted by the FBI for subversive actions against the United States. It was the first time the members of the clan were laughing at Lou. 
So I said to them, you guys shut up. Lou knows more about people than we did. I protect them. If I didn't, I couldn't go on. I said, well, Lou goofed up this time, but we all goof up occasionally, don't we? And they all agreed. So the second time I spun a record, and this guy is talking about aeronautics with an Oxford accent. And Lou says, I see a skinny Englishman with thick eyeglasses and a bald head. <laughs> and he went on projecting his own values. Then later on, the image comes on. It's a black guy, studied aeronautics, raised in England. Well, he spoke with an Oxford accent. Goddamn nigger talking like that. <laughs> this is what Lou said. You know. I said, Lou, if I took your baby and raised him in Scotland, he said, what are you doing, Lottie? You know, he would speak like a Scotsman. Don't you understand that? He says, I can't see that. I said, Lou, if, you, if I took your dog and just raised him by one person and teach him, teach him to hate, Orientals. Every time I see an Oriental run and bite, I could do that by rewarding the dog every time he bites an Oriental. Give him some fresh liver. You know, some <laughs> psychologist said to me, I believe there are certain things that are human nature. I said, like what? He said, like jealousy. I said, give me an example. He said, well, if I reach for my cat and put it on my lap and pat him, the dog growls. So that's what I mean by nature and natural. So I said, Lou, uh, I said, come around in a week or two. I took a, my dog and cat, which I have, and I gave the dog fresh liver, reached for the cat, put it on my lap. I did that 10 times. Every time I reach for the cat, I give the dog something to <coughs> warm, food or something that the dog liked. So his tail would wag every time I reached for the cat. If it was inborn, he would not do that. He still grow. You understand what I mean? So I showed these guys that, that they don't even know how to do research. I said to them, they said to me first, there may be things beyond the physical. I got that from a priest. He said, the trouble with you, John, you're taking all physical conditions of the world and basing your decisions on them. What about the spiritual things? What about the things beyond the physical? I said, I've never seen anything beyond the physical. So they said, well, we have. I said, please, take me there. Mm -hmm. What am I busting my ass up a lot? <laughs> <laughs> there are things that can work without that. So they said, did you ever hear of telekinesis? Do you know what that is? Moving objects without touching them. Oh, okay. They said, we know a woman that lives in Palm Springs. This was in California. And she has the power of telekinesis. She can put, make a book page turn, move a thing on a table without touching it. I said, if she can do that, the hell with science. I'll shout her from the highest tower, take me there. So they called her and said, can we bring Fresco over? He's kind of skeptical. And she said, of course. So I said, ask, ask her if I can check it out while she's doing it. She said, of course. Well, a lot of people have come there dummies and they're around and check things out. So she put this big vase on the table and she went like that with the lights on her and it moved down the table slowly. But you could see it moving. Everybody was there and they were amazed. So I took my fountain pen, which was made of metal, and I'm moving it along the table and I got a buzz, which I felt. And I peeled the veneer off. She, she had a bell buzzer upside down with four rubber shock rounds. So you couldn't transmit vibration. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and also the table was highly polished, slightly tilted. So I said, Father Dunn, two Catholic priests, Father Dempsey, here's how it's done. He said, I thought she was a good person. Well, she is a good person. But her husband, according to the Hall of Records, which I went to, died about 10 years ago. And if a husband and wife are split due to that, your friends will visit you and then less and less, unless you're a couple. That's statistically data. So I, I gave that data and she, first thing she said to me, you son of a bitch, you get out of here. I said, I'm not your enemy. But when you tell these kids you have magical power, they hope things will work out. 
when you want things to work out, you got to work on that. You can't hope they'll work out. So she put her arms around me, we were friends again. But anyway, I try to get people to understand that if you want things to work out, you have to work on them. You have to work on people. You have to be as patient as you can and as connective as you can. You try to tell it to people in their terms so they can understand what you're saying. They don't always understand. Now there's such a thing called ego. When a guy says, man will never fly. If God wanted a man to fly, he'd have been born with wings. Or if he wanted to wear clothing, he'd be born with clothing. He's the same thing. If he wanted him to live in a house, he'd be born in a house. If he wanted him to wear eyeglasses, he'd be born with eyeglasses. That, that's so fucked up religion. It just doesn't work at all in any area. I hope some of you are not still religious, because I can handle that for you. <laughs> so all churches, all religions, I try to account for the nature of the world by saying some people are good, some are bad. There's no such thing as good or bad people. If you're Irish and you lived in Ireland during the famine and a lot of people died, we said, come to America, there's a lot of jobs. And the Irish came here. And they worked for one half the amount that the, the Americans worked for. So people used to beat up the Irish. Do you understand that? When slaves were freed, they worked for less money than a white man. So let's go beat up a nigger. You see, all these things, let's go beat up a Jew, let's go beat up a dumb Polak. They had the same thing for all people. So what they want to do is divide people. You Polish, be proud of it. You Irish, be proud of it. And you separate people. And they can't join together. You know what I mean? Form a vital force. But again, all people need good, clean air, decent living, medical care from birth to death. They all need the same thing. They say if you took away the money system, what would motivate people? You ever get, get that idea? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Martin Luther King marched into the South. Nobody said we're going to deposit $40,000 in the Swiss bank. Gandhi was shot. He did it because he believed in it. Do you understand? Yeah. But if you're brought up to believe in money, I don't trust people. When a doctor says you need your kidney removed, Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Or maybe he's trying to pay off a new boat he bought. You can't be that sure when a person says certain things to you. You know what I mean? So in the case of uh, incentive, a lot of people worked on uh, the fact that the Earth, use instruments to determine that the Earth is round. No one paid him for it. No one got paid for trying to find out how the brain works. People put up funds and helped support them. But before that, you were not allowed to do an autopsy. The church did not want the body cut up. And women were brought up to cherish a baby. That an abortionist is killing the baby. But if these women were consistent, they'd fight war. Why, why have war? You kill pregnant women, children, all kinds of people. This way they wait outside an abortion an abortionist's office and shoot them. If they really were for pro-life, they would prevent people, they'd make it so all people got medical care that needed whether they had the money or not. Do you understand? They're inconsistently stupid. <laughs> so I'm trying to tell you, giving you the devices. So at the Klan meeting, after I ran the record, and it was a black guy, Lou said to me, you mean to say that if my kid was raised with a nigger, he, he act like a nigger? I said, yeah. When he was young enough, brought up in, by an impoverished black family that was not educated, he said, dad's right, you're right, mm -hmm. just like the poor blacks or the poor white. They call them the white trash. They talk a certain way. They say, uh, I'm beholden to you if they owe you money. I don't want to be beholden. Well, if you took a black kid and raised him by that family, that's the way he'd speak. A black kid raised in England speaks like an Englishman. In Germany, the black kid would say, Auf die Liebe. You know, or they would say things that Germans say, like a German, and move like a German.
And if they're brought up in France, the black guys say, La Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. Now I want you to know this. A Frenchman built two wings, three feet long, and he jumped off the top of the Eiffel Tower. And he died trying to fly, trying to beat the wing. And his brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time. How can you know? That means that no one ever does anything wrong. How would you know how big to make wings? before man flies. So the guy that made the larger wings, he didn't jump off the top of the island, he jumped off the first layer. <laughs> and he, the wings fell for a while and they went <laughs> And a, a seaman said, you gotta brace those wings like we brace the mass of the ship, otherwise the air pressure's so great. <laughs> so they braced the wings. That's what I mean by man never invented anything. Other men built small wings and jumped off top of barn and broke their legs. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people died before man flies. But in our school books, it said the Wright brothers invented the airplane. That's strictly bullshit. Nobody ever invented anything. I'm going to try to prove it to you now. So you have to use these examples. Okay? So I was invited to Princeton University to speak on man never invented anything. And it was called Man Can't Think or reason. And I believe that. That applies to me, too. I'm not apart from that. So they said, at Princeton, we want to speak at the sociology department. But I wanted to speak to all those departments. Right. So I said, man can't think of reason. That made every department angry. And they all wanted to come to the meeting. And when they came to the meeting, it was so crowded they had to hold it in the auditorium because we had people in every sector. And this guy from the cat optics department said, I take issue with your jock. I believe man can think of reason. So I said, give me one example of man thinking. One. He said, there are thousands of examples. I said, I can't do anything with that. Think of one thing. Well, somebody had to think of a camera. There was a time when there was no camera. Somebody thought of the pinhole camera. Well, a thousand years ago in the Holy Land, if you lived in a clay hut with a little hole in it, if the sun was out, you saw people walking upside down on your wall. I don't know if you understand yeah. that. Mm -hmm. If you go into a barn, it's very dark. You know what a knot hole is in a barn? Mm -hmm. There's a little hole. You'll see cows walking on your wall upside down. Not very sharp. When they go in any dark building, that's where the pinhole camera came from. So the guy got mad at me. He says, I'll grant you that. What about the movie camera? Somebody had to invent a movie camera. The Chinese used to make pads of paper, and they'd bind them all together. Whole band of pad paper. And they'd write the Chinese characters up and down. And they made a mark in the corner of the page. Now, when you picture 10 pages bound together, if you happen to go, that mark jumped around. You know what I'm talking about? So a Chinese artist drew a bird with wings in different positions in the corner of the paper. And the bird did this. Then he drew waves in different positions like that. And, you went, and he saw the waves and a man walking. Then the, a Chinese carpenter didn't like that pad. So he put all those pictures that he drew in a circle like that. So it looked like a paddle wheel. I hope you can understand that drawing. All, they're all supposed to be pictures like a paddle wheel. When you turn the paddle wheel, you can see the bird flying and the man walking. And the more pictures you put in, the smoother the action. They put more pictures in. Then he put the wheel on the and he turned it, crank, and you saw a man walking. That over a thousand years ago in China, that was done. And a Frenchman saw that, and he machined it out of brass. Beautiful job. And when you turn it, you have wall bearings, and a lot of pictures, they were photographs. And it worked beautifully. Edison bought it from the Frenchman. They say Edison invented the movie camera. He did not. It's serially developed, you know what I mean? Right. Nobody thinks of a telephone right away. Who invented Alexander Graham Bell. 
No, he didn't invent it. He, he noticed something made a noise when it went scratched another thing. So he, he used another principle. The guy says, if you take a disc, if you take a, a metal disc and put a magnet behind it, put a coil of wire around it, and you talk in front of the metal disc, it vibrates the metal disc. Mm -hmm. It makes it go nearer the magnet and further the magnet. And if you run a coil of wire on it, the current varies. But little by little, the telephone came. It did not come as an invention any more than the airplane. A lot of people died. A lot of people made planes that didn't fly. A lot of people made planes that went up and crashed and killed them. Nobody, when I say nobody ever invented anything, Edison said he used 7,000 different elements in that lamp. And electricity conducted a wire. If you used the wrong wire, it got red hot. That suggested the electric lamp. If you run an electric current through different metals just to see how they conduct it, certain metals would get red hot, others wouldn't. You understand? That's where the light. Then he took that red hot wire and he held it around. If only I could make it hotter. So I put it in the glass, took a glass, ordinary drinking, and I put it over it so that people wouldn't get burnt. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And then he sealed the bottom, but the element burnt out, and he didn't know why or how. So he went to a college nearby, and he asked a college professor, why does this thing keep burning out? Oh, there's just, there's just air in the glass. So he vacuumed the air out that existed. When he pumped the air out, he had the filament that didn't burn out right away. You understand yeah. that? Nobody invented, they tell you in school, at least when I went to school, somebody invented the wheel. And the wheel was the beginning of the technical age. I'm sure you heard that shit. Uh, <laughs> when a log falls over on another log, and you pull the one on top, it rolls. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. When a log or a tree falls over on another tree, if it's round, if you pull the top one, the bottom one rolls. That was the beginning of the wheel. But if there was one stone in the way, it would stop that from turning. So they shaved the bark off the middle and made it less than the outside. That's where the wheel came from. Nobody said, gotta make a wheel. <laughs> or they tell you that man thinks. He can't think. If he lives in a cave, and this is a man in the cave. Must be a man sitting in a cave. When you climb a hill, if you step on the severe incline, you slip. If you step on a slight flat area, you get up the hill. So when we climb a hill, we look for the flat areas. After he lives there 10 years, it gets to look like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? He doesn't come to a cave and say, I've got to make steps to get up there. He can't do that. The brain doesn't work like that. Do you understand what yeah. I'm getting at? You have to show people the origin. They tell you that Leonardo da Vinci was ahead of his time. You heard that, right? Sure. I would say that the people he associated with were not like the other people. They talk of gears, levers, other things. Where do you think he got it all from? You understand? They associated with different kinds right. of people. So whenever you see anything new, you think, my God, the guy's got a fantastic mind. So he says, it just came to me one day. He doesn't know where it came from. Ask inventors, how do you invent? They don't know. Any more than a kid knows how he walks. Well, how do you talk? Or well, who invented language? It says in school they invented language to communicate. Bullshit. Somebody banged his elbow and went, oh, banged his knee, oh, he ate something good. Mm. That's where language came from. As you encounter things, you made sounds. If you saw a lion, oh, blah, blah, whatever you said, the guy said, whoa, whoa, yeah, that's a lion. A language <laughs> over many, many years are the sounds you made in relation to water. You hit the water and it's like, blah, 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 or, or, or this. And the guy said, like that. So language evolved over a great length of time. Nobody sat down and said, I gotta make language to talk to people. 
How do you do that? It's ridiculous. No man started cooking one day. There was a forest fire, and the pig tastes much better after it was burnt. So they started cooking. So I asked an Indian, an American Indian, do you know where the bow and arrow come from? Here's where it winds up. His great-grandfather told him that the Indians used to skin a bear, and the skin looked something like this. That's a skin bear. And when they put it out in the sun to dry, it shrunk. It became very tiny, and the Indians were angry at that, so they made a frame, which they had made, made in the past. They always made frames. And they took strands of leather and tied it to the skin all around. So it wouldn't shrink too much. Mm -hmm. You understand that? Mm -hmm. But the strands of leather that you cut would shrink when you put it on the sun. They become short and fat, and that bothered the Indians. So they tied the strip as a strip of leather to a twig of wood. If it was fat enough, this couldn't shrink very much. If they happened to run out of fat pieces and use a thin piece of wood, it shrunk and pulled the wood into a bow. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The wood was bent like that, and the leather that was there. And when you plucked on it, it went bung, and hence the heart. You know what I mean? Do you understand that? If you tie a piece of leather to a thin piece of wood, the leather shrinks, it bends the wood. You make, then you, 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 from then on, you would add slowly to it. So I would say the bow and arrow was invented over a long period of time. Or if a guy hit an animal with a fist, and a guy picked up a rock and hit the animal. Well, there was a rock in his life, there wasn't, he, was a, <laughs> he had no future. So if a guy had a rock on the end of a stick, he could swing it and keep the rock not loose as a weapon. The gun was the equalizer. Before the gun was invented, a big guy could pick up a little guy and throw him around. But with the gun, you were equalized. You know what I mean? You fight and take on a large guy or a small guy. Would you guys like to walk around and see the place? Yeah. yeah. yeah.